Welcome to Off Grid Path. This is a 12 part series on how we converted a rundown static caravan into our dream cabin here in the UK. I want to deep dive into how we went from this dilapidated static caravan into our cozy cabin home with no experience whatsoever. For those of you who are wanting to do something similar, I'll be taking you through all of the things that worked really well and also the countless mistakes and things that definitely didn't work throughout the whole process. If you want to check out this series and more videos like this, then just head over to my YouTube channel, Off Grid Path, and subscribe for more updates. Welcome to part three of this 12 part series where we are renovating a static caravan into our dream cabin home. And in this episode, we're very much focusing on installing the log burner. Now, I want to just put a bit of a disclaimer out that obviously I'm not a certified burner installer and no doubt there will be things that I have done wrong in this install. So everything that I researched prior to installing the log burner and there was extensive research sort of going back and forth, a lot of uh, watching on YouTube and looking at regulations and things like that. There's not a huge amount out there in terms of installing a burner in a caravan, um, which is obviously a fire risk. And I wanted to sort of err on the side of caution I watched a lot of people installing burners into vans and things like that, which were really sketchy. So with this, I, I obviously wanted it to be safe. Uh, I don't think it was ever going to get signed off, but it was, you know, very much safety was was sort of number one concern when installing the burner. So first thing I did was use some of that Vicas fireball, which I showed you in the previous uh, part two where we're renovating the log burner to pad out the inside and reduce the output of the burner. I used that same Vicas fireboard to use as a backing on the wall. Obviously we've got OSB on the walls and I needed to fireproof those walls around the burner so that heat transfer you know, wouldn't be an issue sort of going through to the wood. So used the, the Vicas fireboard, measured that up and put that in place with an air gap behind it as well and I think one of the big mistakes I made during this was that there wasn't enough air gap there I think by regulation you need to have an air gap at the bottom of that that fireboard for air to go through and when I put the uh, the half in which you'll see um, that very much went up to it so there's no air coming through the bottom of it so that was one mistake if you're thinking about doing something similar to this that's something to bear in mind so use that fireboard just to pad around and quite high up on the burner. Uh, the reason I didn't go all the way up with the fireboard was because I was using a twin wall flue that really doesn't radiate that much heat. So I was kind of, I, I did go quite high on the, the fireboard. And since having the burner in, you know, there's very little heat that is escaping above that and sort of transferring through. So once that fireboard was on uh, for the backing for the burner, it was very much a case of sort of sighting the burner where it was going to go, and then I'd start thinking about the half and how that was going to how that was going to look. Uh, and we decided, you know, there was a lot of talk about um, using slate and finding a nice bit of slate, but really incredibly expensive to buy to you know to buy a slate half. They're not cheap things to buy. Also, because of the you know the angle of of the the burner, it was going to be quite difficult to find a piece big enough that that would fit the corner but also come out you know nicely because it was it was going to be angled it was not going to go the burner wasn't going to go flat to square on a wall it was very much at an angle as you can see so in the end I had a I had a good friend who knew quite a bit about concrete and said he'd help me lay some concrete down um, so we did a concrete mix just a very rudimentary way of mixing comp concrete with a, um, a bit of a sort of tart material and that worked really well I mean luckily I'd never mixed concrete before and so I didn't know much about it but it worked really well he put a bit of a dye in it just to darken it up a little bit so and also we put fiberglass um, they're not shavings they're like little fiberglass um, strands in there and the idea with that was to strengthen up the concrete and uh, minimize the chances of that cracking uh, so that was fairly thick probably about four or five inches thick of concrete that we put in there it also meant that I could build the frame kind of shuttering for the concrete and make the concrete exactly how, you know, make the area exactly how the shape that you that you want it to be. And that was the issue that we were having with, um, you know, the idea of getting 
getting a bit of slate hearth that we wouldn't have the kind of shape or area that we wanted so concrete works really well with that and the install was fairly straightforward and left left that sort of curing and drying for a couple of days and came back in and it was actually a lot lighter than I thought it would be because with the dye that we put in it looked very dark and then when we came back in and it dried it was much a much lighter shade on a side note um, it did before we put the concrete down I was told to just put a bit of PVA down there um, just to give it some kind of binding it's like a binding agent I guess just something for the concrete to, to bind to rather than just the bare OSB so once the concrete was in it was very much now a, a chance to put the burner in place exactly where it's going to go and one of the you know that the burners refurb but we did actually buy the twin wall flue um, brand new and I think that cost probably about 100 and I think it was about 150 pounds all in all for the all of the flue um, pieces we, we we needed yeah this was very much trial and error and figuring it out as we went so it was I, I just kind of dangled something from from the roof we obviously needed to get it in between the rafters we didn't want it the 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 flue to get too close to the rafters and just dan dangled something down to try and get the right spot that we needed to cut through the roof uh, the roof was very easy to cut through just made a really terrible rudimentary ladder to get up on the roof and the roof is actually kind of tin metal roof even though it's made to look like tiles it's actually just a metal roof so just went through it with a drill bit and then used a metal bit on a jigsaw just to hack out the the kind of um, shape that I needed it's not a very neat job it didn't need to be hugely neat because that was going to be covered up by a flashing so just needed to get that hole around the flue and obviously larger than the flue to give a bit of an air gap um, not air gap but just a gap so there's no metal touching the flue basically no material touching the flue so again that didn't need to be neat it just needed to do its job because that was going to be completely covered up by the flashing yeah the flashing was quite an uh not i wouldn't say awkward but you're cutting a hole into the roof essentially so it's quite a scary thing to do because you're just exposing the cabin and obviously with leaks and things like that we get a lot of rain in the winter so um the flashing wasn't the easiest to fix it was very much a bit of luck in terms of where the flue would would sit on the roof and and you know relation to where the tiles were, fake fake tiles were coming down because there's only one position the burner could be in the main priority was not letting it touch the, the flue touch or get close to the rafters we wanted a real gap between the flue and the rafters once it got to the roof we were quite lucky in terms of where it was lying but it's still you know you're, you're dealing with lots of little um rigid and, and changes in 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 depth and, and heights and things to to for, because of the, the tile um, the way that lies so we just used um, self tapping uh, roofing screws essentially and they come with a little washer as you tighten it down self taps through the metal and then sort of clamps down and this washer just swishes so that the idea with that washer is that it that's what stops any water coming in from leakages and things so once that was installed, I then used just a bit of chicken wire and that was just to put around the, oh, there's a name for the top hat basically that goes on the, on the flue and I can't remember what it's called but I'm just going to call it a top hat. And the reason I wanted to use chicken wire was just to stop any birds potentially nesting in there. Obviously you don't want birds sort of coming in and then lighting the fire, it's not a nice thing. So, you know, we had a bit of spare chicken wire and I thought that was quite a good thing just to wrap around, just to stop anything potentially nesting in there. Fast forward a year, that chicken wire is completely burnt off now. So if anyone's thinking about using it, it's great to start with, but obviously the heat coming out of the flue will just burn that wire down eventually to until there's nothing there so it doesn't last very long and i'm still trying to think of something i haven't had a problem with with nesting birds or anything like that but it would be nice to have like a more permanent fix and i can't think of anything else aside from just welding you know some bars onto the top hat um you know anything that would would last and be sort of sufficient for that uh, although saying that I haven't had a look online I'm sure there are products online that you can buy for those for that specific reason so at this point the burner was installed and it was a really exciting moment for us because this was going to be the first time we'd lit a fire in the cabin obviously the cabin's completely gutted and like I was saying in the previous episode 
we wanted to get that burner in as quickly as possible because we wanted to be able to have the heating on in the cabin as we built it to just dry things as we went the cabin was incredibly damp when we first you know were gutting it so we wanted to give it the best possible chance while it was gutted to really dry everything out and so this first burn was a real milestone for us in the cabin it was a great feeling knowing that we're coming into the winter the days were getting colder and knowing that we could have fire while we're building and also you know and heat but also be able to just the simple act of being able to put a kettle on top of the burner and boil water for a cup of tea that was a huge thing i know it doesn't sound big but it's a it's a really big step forward when you've when you're building a, a home and all of a sudden you you now have heat and you've got a way of boiling water which was just fantastic it was a great feeling to have on a side note with the burners um i know in, in previous films a few of you have asked you know do you have a co2 alarm and, and smoke alarm and things like that yes a good friend of mine is a fireman and he came round and told us exactly what we needed in terms of alarms and where to put them where best place to place them and i just took that you know as uh took his his obviously expert opinion on that and did exactly what he said so we've got a co2 alarm which is positioned strategically sp specifically for the burner and then we also have a smoke and heat detector alarm which is in the kitchen so for those of you who are wondering we do have those because of the burner size like i was saying in the previous episode it's a 10 and a half kilowatt burner uh, it's a huge burner but we've reduced that output still and this and even in the winter having spent a winter with it on as our sole heating we have to have the windows open which is obviously great for airflow but we have to have them open because it's just too hot if we close the windows so it's incredibly efficient at heating the space that it is heating but almost too efficient because it just gets too hot so we actually have to have windows open and we have two windows open especially in, in, in even in the winter but that creates this nice airflow you know constant airflow coming through the cabin so it works out really well especially in terms of the the carbon dioxide kind of worry of having a burner yeah overall the install has worked really well we're really happy with it i mean it'd be interesting Obviously, like I said, I'm not an expert in installing log burners. It's the first and only burner I've ever installed. It's a refurbished burner, except from the flu. But everything went pretty smoothly. Um, I would say the first burn, we were so excited and we totally forgot about the fact that we painted the stove. So the first burn was just emitting horrible fumes in, into the cabin because of the stove paint we used. Um, when we refurbished the stove and obviously that has to burn off or the chemicals on that have to burn off we totally forgot about that we just got carried away we were too excited to to do our first burn it took probably two to maybe three burns on the log burner to just get rid of that chemical smell from from the stove paint so it's something to bear in mind if you're ever using stove paint to light the burner when you're not when you're not kind of around or at least you can air it out don't think oh we're gonna have a nice evening let's light the burner and then all of a sudden your evening's ruined because you're you're inhaling horrible chemically smells but so that's it for part three very much all about the log burner in episode four and our next part four of our 12 part series of there's a lot going on we're looking at cladding on the outside prepping that for cladding sorting out flooring on the inside starting to look at the bathroom and getting that prepped and how all that's going to look so lots of different things going on for the build in part four so if you have any questions about this episode or any others please leave those in the comments below i'll do my best to get back to you and for now thanks for watching and hopefully see you on the next part cheers <laughs>